Hello and welcome to The Sidebar, presented by True Crime Daily, taking you inside the courtrooms of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based in Los Angeles and previously an L.A. County prosecutor for nearly a decade. We are recording this on Thursday, May 30th, 2024. In this week's episode, a mother sentenced in her daughter's death after bottle feeding her four-year-old a diet subsisting of Mountain Dew. Plus, breaking news as a former TikTok star charged with double homicide is convicted on all counts. But first, opening statements as a husband faces charges for the murder of his wife more than 10 years after her death. I'm flying solo this week, folks, and we've got a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and just jump right in. First, out of Dyer County, Tennessee, prosecutors may be facing an uphill battle in the murder trial of a man accused of slaying his wife more than 10 years ago with zero physical evidence. David Swift was charged with murder in 2022 for the death of his wife, Karen Smith, who went missing after a 2011 Halloween party. Her body was later discovered in an abandoned cemetery with signs of blunt force trauma. David was allegedly the last person to see Karen alive, and her disappearance occurred just under a month after she filed for a divorce from him. In opening statements, prosecutors sought to build their circumstantial case, portraying David as the only person with the means and motive to kill the mother of four. Meanwhile, the defense has pointed out the lack of physical evidence and argued that David was physically injured at the time of Karen's death and could not carry out such an attack. Adding to his troubles, David has also been charged in another case with stalking his second wife for following her after she filed for divorce from him. David maintains his innocence in both matters. All right, this is a great opportunity, I think, to talk about the difference between circumstantial and direct evidence. And we hear this a lot, that people categorize a case as being circumstantial and the idea being that it's somehow lesser or somehow weaker. And that's, first of all, not true mostly and is oftentimes even different from what the actuality is of how the case will work out in court. What do I mean by that? Well, direct evidence is something that if true, if it is proven true, directly proves a fact. This can be an eyewitness. This could be videotape. This could be audio tape. This could be a confession. Something that if true, directly proves a fact. Whereas circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence, meaning that if that thing um, is proven, it proves something that you need an inference, a logical inference to prove the underlying fact at issue. And what do we mean by that? Well, the classic example is, and they always explain this uh, in a courtroom, the judges will explain it to jurors during voir dire when talking about circumstantial evidence. And they'll say, ladies and gentlemen, if a man came into the back of this courtroom right now, <clears throat> and imagine for yourself, first of all, a courtroom with no windows. But if a man came into the back of this courtroom right now and he was wearing a raincoat and that raincoat had uh, what looked like droplets of water all over it and he was shaking out an umbrella, all of that is evidence of that he's got a wet coat. That's direct evidence. He's holding an umbrella. That's direct evidence. Uh, and that he's wearing a raincoat. That's direct evidence. But the logical inference you can make, the indirect evidence that that can prove as an underlying fact, is that it's raining outside. And when we have an example like that, we realize that circumstantial evidence can be incredibly powerful. You don't need to look outside direct evidence to see that it's raining to understand from the indirect circumstantial evidence that it was raining outside. And in circumstantial com evidence can be incredibly powerful because I think there's a natural instinct in all of us to solve mysteries, especially if you're sitting as a juror. You feel like part of your job is to unravel this mystery. You've got two opposing sides, the prosecution and the defense, and they're both trying to tell you what they believe the evidence is and what they, their version of the facts will play out and what the actual quote unquote story is of what took place. And you're trying to unravel it. And circumstantial evidence can many times be very intriguing to uh, jurors to be able to put that case together. 
The other thing that makes this case, I think, um, even though putting aside this issue of circumstantial versus direct, even if it is circumstantial, you've got a case with a lot of two of the elements that are most likely to prove who is the culprit of a crime. And those two are motive and opportunity. If you have a person who no one else had a reason for this person to end up dead, that's your likely candidate. That's your likely suspect. And if that same person, your likely suspect, had the opportunity, meaning there's no rock-solid alibi, they had the means to commit the crime, then you're looking at a very solid suspect and likely the defendant, like we have in this case. He had a motive in that they were going through a divorce and he had the opportunity and that he was the last one to see her alive. The other thing, and I think likely the clincher in this case as to why prosecutors followed it, is that second case with his second wife, who's accusing him now of stalking her after a divorce. This demonstrates something about this person's character. And I realize the character evidence is not to be used at trial, but this will come in for some sort of reason, whether that's to show motive or or uh, some other underlying admissible reason, you can bet dollars to donuts the idea that he has a stalking case against his second wife is going to become an issue here in this murder trial. And just to demonstrate to jurors that this is a person who has a real problem with women leaving him. Now, this case is early on. Uh, there's lots of developments. There's plenty of trial to be had. But those are just my thoughts moving in as we begin trial on this case. And we will, of course, keep you updated every step of the way. Let's move on to San Diego, California, where wasting little time, a jury has convicted a former TikTok star of double homicide in a case we've been following closely on this podcast. Ali Abulaban was found guilty on all counts for the shooting deaths of his wife, Anna Abulaban, and her friend Rayburn Barron, whom Ali suspected was sleeping with his wife. The question of who pulled the trigger was never in question in this trial. Ali's defense simply contended that the executions were a crime of passion, seeking to lessen the convictions to second-degree murder or even manslaughter. This claim apparently bore little weight with the jurors, however, who heard evidence that Ali had bugged the apartment with a listening app on his daughter's iPad before arming himself, driving to the location, and immediately shooting both victims. The once famous TikToker took the stand in his own defense where he became heated under cross-examination as he was asked about previous acts of domestic violence he had committed on Anna before her death. Emotional tensions ran high throughout the trial, and the conclusion was no exception, with the judge pausing the reading of the verdict as cheers broke out in the courtroom after the first guilty pronouncement. Ali is scheduled to, for sentencing on June 28th and faces a sentence of life per, without parole. The first question I think we need to address is, did his testimony help or hurt him in this case? And obvious from the results, it didn't carry the day. But actually, I think the better question is, did he have a choice on whether or not to testify? And my thought on that is that no, he, he really didn't have a choice. This was a case where his mindset, what was going through his head at the time, was so important to his defense because he had admitted the crime far before taking the stand. He admitted it to police. He had even in some way admitted it to his daughter. So the idea of saying he didn't do this, not going to happen. Self-defense, not going to happen. Any kind of defense that they had a chance at was this idea of heat of passion. And without, and here's that term, circumstantial evidence of heat of passion, you have to look to something more direct like his own testimony and telling the jurors, that he was, in fact, in this maddened state at that time and couldn't control himself. But the other part of this is that he did himself no favors in the way that he testified. Throughout his testimony, he was blaming his wife 
and her friend for their own deaths. He was narcissistic. He was attempting to portray himself as the real victim at every opportunity. This was, quite frankly, just a dislikable person on the stand. And jurors, if they hadn't been convinced already of this man's guilt, I think took no sympathy in the way that he behaved himself during testimony. And in fact, at points, the way that he was reacting to prosecutors, you could see a glimpse of this person's anger and ability to fly off the handle. But how did it play into the crime of passion argument? He testified that he snapped. And that's usually what you're looking for in a crime of passion. A person who is reacting to something in the immediate and it creates such passion in them, such emotional uh, disturbance in them that they act out in a way that they really couldn't form the proper criminal intent required for a first degree or second degree murder. The typical example that we see is that someone walks home, you know, the, 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 the husband comes home early from work. He finds his wife in bed with his neighbor. And in the heat of the moment, he grabs whatever's nearby and beats somebody to death with it. That is what we call heat of passion. There's no cooling off period. It was a person who just was um, confronted with something they couldn't deal with properly. And they, and without being able to form that proper criminal intent, they acted. Voluntary manslaughter. That is not what we have here. What we have here and what the prosecution did an excellent job of laying out was a first degree case. And that comes down to really one word, premeditation. That does not always necessarily involve planning. When we talk about premeditation, I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking of it as somebody who's been scheming and planning for days before they commit a murder. Not necessarily. In this case, the prosecution did a wonderful job of laying out not only his premeditation, but how he had every opportunity to cool down, to have a cooling period before he committed these atrocious crimes. First, there was the listening device that he installed. And it's not necessarily the installation of the device that's the problem when it comes to the murder. That's a crime in and of itself. But it was that he heard what was happening and he decided to do something about it. That's when the heat of passion may have occurred. But when you then go from where he heard what was going on to arming himself with a gun to making the drive from where he was at all the way over to the location of the apartment where these murders took place, the elevator ride up. The prosecutors played the video inside of the elevator to show this calm and collected man who it took a a minute or two for the ride up in the elevator. All of this time, he could have been cooling himself down. And instead, he walks down the hallway and in more video footage that they showed during trial, you can see him turn the corner and almost instantaneously, you start to hear uh, gunshots ring out. This was a murder, a premeditated murder. And I think the jurors got it right. Um, And I think that he probably didn't have a chance given the facts, uh, but the way that he testified certainly did him no favors. But his sentencing will be later this month, and we will, of course, keep you updated. All right, moving on to Claremont County, Ohio, where a mother has been sentenced in her daughter's death after bottle feeding the four-year-old a diet consisting largely of Mountain Dew. Tamara Banks pleaded guilty to one count of involuntary manslaughter for the tragic death of her daughter, Carmody, who died of diabetes complications that went undiagnosed and untreated despite signs of a serious medical issue. Though the child's condition worsened for days prior to the death, Banks and her partner failed to contact medical personnel until the girl had turned blue and stopped breathing. The death was linked to the consumption of sugary sodas, which prosecutors allege Banks had been feeding the child since weaning her off formula, the consumption of which had rotted out nearly all of the child's teeth prior to her death. Banks will serve at least nine years in prison on the charge, However, in Ohio, the length of her sentence will be ultimately determined by the Department of Corrections based on her conduct, 
while incarcerated, which means she could serve up to 13 and a half years of prison. We talk about a lot of very disturbing cases on this show, and I got to say that this one is right up there because it's beyond neglect, I think, to treat a child this way. It starts to turn into abuse and torture, most certainly. I realize she accepted a plea here, and that was something that was negotiated with her attorneys and the prosecution. But the question kind of becomes, was that too lenient? Should the prosecutors have gone forward with a murder trial here? Um, and as passionately as you might feel about this, as I, I'm sure that you are, realizing that this poor little girl lost her life because her mother simply couldn't follow even the bare minimum amount of care for her um, and allowed her essentially to rot to death and acquire a disease to die. Um, it's not always a difficult decision for prosecutors. And what do I mean by that? Well, there is certainly nothing guaranteed when it comes to trials. Um, there's an old saying that two things you should never bet on are hockey and jury trials because you just never know how a jury is going to decide and we could go on and on talking about all the cases where we felt that they were rock solid and somebody uh, got an acquittal and walked and there's just as many cases where they seem incredibly weak and somebody gets a prosecution uh, a conviction out of it and that's not to say that every jury trial is a complete crapshoot and you never know how it's going to turn out. Most trials, I think, turn out generally how people feel that they played out in court. But there is no guarantee. There is a chance. There is a chance that 12 jurors could have listened to this and thought, you know what, this woman is not really abusive. She's just ignorant. She just didn't understand the proper care for a child. And I know some of you might, might think that's absolutely ridiculous. How could anyone come to the conclusion that you could give a child Mountain Dew and feel like that's fine? But we don't know the circumstances surrounding this. And there could have been an argument. I agree with you. I don't think it would have carried the day, but there could have been. But what do you do when you're a prosecutor in that in that position? What do you how do you handle um realizing that there's a chance that you could not be able to put this case on and you've got someone who wants to plead and who wants to serve prison time um, and accept responsibility for it. And so many times I think that is what prosecutors makes their job so difficult is that sometimes it's better to take that conviction than you have in hand rather than to risk it for something that you feel might be a in better service of justice. Um, there's also, uh, Banks had another son who also nearly died of an undiagnosed diabetic condition, but survived after a sibling forced the mother to get help. What role did that play in all of this in the prosecutors, um, making a decision to, to accept a plea and to charge what they did charge in this case? Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess I just point that out to say that there are many instances where we don't understand all of the underlying facts and it's somehow sometimes very easy to um, react to what has happened, uh, especially in a case where we didn't get to see it all play out in trial. And this case, I think, is another good demonstration, just as a last thought on this, on when the behavior of a parent crosses over the border of negligent parenting and into the threshold of murder or being held responsible for murder in some degree, whether that's first, second, or manslaughter. Um, and we're starting, I think, to see a, a bit of a sea change in the way that prosecutors are treating that in that parents are being held far more responsible for um, the way that they parent and that this idea of what I was just explaining, I didn't know any better. I was just trying to do the best that I could with the resources that I had is not um, not as persuasive uh, nowadays as it, as it once may have been. Um, and I think that's a very good thing. But it's a very, very tragic case. Um, sad whenever a loved one loses their life and certainly... Uh, even more so in a situation where 
even just the smallest amount of care could have done something to avoid this. Um, but it, it, I, I, it breaks my heart to think about what that poor little girl went through during her very short life. But on that very sad note, uh, this is our show for this week. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to just give all of our listeners and viewers our sincerest thanks for tuning in. Uh, however you watch or listen, we truly appreciate you. I am Josh Ritter, as always, your host. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ. And if you want to hear more of my thoughts and coverage on even more true crime cases, you can also check me out on my new YouTube channel, Courtroom Confidential. Please check it out. And you can, of course, find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. In the meantime, we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD sidebar. And thank you again for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar.